two alternative um, phylogeny. This is the one that's molecular. So if we look at where these are placed, here's the platea helminthes, here's the rotifera, right? And then if we look at the next groups that we're going to talk about, this would be mollusca and annelida. And notice in this particular instance, they have the roundworms and the arthropods separated out, okay? So the next group we're going to talk about are the mollusks. So you do not need to know these groups that we haven't talked about. So Stentophora, you don't need to know that one. Acela, right? You don't need to know Ectoprocta or Brachiopoda, Coda, okay? So we're just gonna move on to the mollusks. Okay, so mollusca means soft-bodied. So mollusk means soft. And this is the most diverse phyla in terms of all the different um, kinds of organisms that are um, found in them. So if we look at the diversity, we have like clams, okay? We have squid, we have snails, we have slugs. I think I'm missing one. Things like oysters. Anybody else think about what might be in here? What would you add to that list, do you think? Octopus, excellent. There's also one that's related to the squid and the octopus that has a shell. Does anybody know what that's called? It's a shell, and it's a shell that's very famous, named for a, a, the very famous shell shape. A nautilus, excellent. We also have organisms that are called nudobronchs. And this is a name for a sea slug. And they're actually, um, of all the um, mollusks, we see that the nudibranchs um, are actually the most diverse in the number of species. Okay. So if we look at the characteristics that make it so all of these organisms are in this group, okay. We would say one, these all have a muscular foot, okay? However, it has been modified into a tentacle in some. Okay, so it has a muscular foot. So in some, it has become the tentacles. The other characteristic that all these organisms have is a um, mantle. And so a mantle is a tissue that secretes a shell. So even though some of these organisms have a dramatically reduced shell or have lost their shell, like slugs, right? Slugs do not have a shell. They still have a mantle. And we'll talk about its function in terms of um, terrestrial slugs. And they actually use their mantle to breathe. Okay. So the third thing that characterizes these organisms is what is called a visceral mass. So viscera is like body organs, right? And mass suggests that there's more than one type of organ kind of pushed together, like glommed together. And so this means that the digestive and re reproductive organism, organs, excuse me, digestive and reproductive organs are one big mass, right? So they have like a liver, it's a digestive gland, um, and then they're gonads, it's kind of all together, and it's called the visceral mass. Okay, so all of the mollusks have these three characteristics. So if we look at the different groups, we can see how they have diverged from the ancestral form and have become more 
or less complicated. Okay. So this is like your typical mollusk, and this is a picture um, from your book. So this is, it would be like a snail. So we have the muscular foot, and in this case, they use it for moving around. This is the, in green is the mantle, which secretes the shell. And then notice that we have like this intestine and stomach and digestive organs right here. And that is what is referred to as the visceral mass. So that big structure right there is the visceral mass. Okay. So you need to learn the classes of the mollusks. And so the first class that we're going to talk about are the gastropods. And this literally means stomach footed. Right? So the gastropods use their muscular foot to move around. And so there, it's kind of like their ventral surface of their body, right? So this would include slugs and snails. And this is the most numerous species. Right? So there's, there's the most species are the gastropods compared to like the cephalopods. Okay. We also have the clams, the oysters, and those other organisms. And they are said to be bivalves. So they're in the class bivalvia. So this means two shells, two valves, right? And so this would be clams, oysters, um, what else? What else do we eat that is? Oh, I can't think of. Mussels, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay. And then we have the cephalopods. And these are the head footed. So remember we talked about cephalization and how that's the formation of the brain. So cephalo means head and pod means foot. So these would be the octopus, the squid, and the nautilus. So I didn't mention this one. Um, you don't need to know this particular one. But notice how this one has many plates. And it's actually called polyplecophora. And so you might see these at the Oregon coast. These are commonly referred to as chitons. And they are also considered mollusks. They're almost impossible to like pry from the, um, from the substrate, from the rock, because of their muscular foot kind of um, it causes them to adhere to the rock, and it's really hard to get them up off the surface. Okay, so here's an oyster, and oysters are kind of interesting because they swim. So they actually bring water into their shell, and so if you've ever seen them, sometimes they move like this right through the water. And they also have eye spots. And so remember that we talked about there was a cnidarian, the box jellies that had eye spots, right? The cubozoid um, cnidarians. But the oysters also have eye spots. So they can and not maybe not see images, but they can detect light and movement. This is a sea slug. So this is what is referred to as a nudibranch. And the nudibranchs are extremely diverse. And they're found, um, most diversity is in the uh, coral reef ecosystems. And like off in Indonesia, there's these big hot spots of nudibranch diversity where there's just tons of different species characterized by these little appendages. These are gills that they can use to breathe, but they're also um, a defense mechanism. And so these nudibranchs actually exhibit what is referred to as the acquisition of a trait or of a foreign genome. Actually, let's put just the acquisition of traits because I changed that. So remember how I mentioned that there's different mechanisms of macroevolution. And one of them is, is that you could just directly acquire a trait. 
And so with the jellyfish um, becoming photosynthetic, it's sting stingless. That would be an example of a trait. But this one is, I think, actually even neater. So nudibranchs feed on cnidarians. So this is actually a colony of polyps that you're seeing right here, um, kind of similar to Obelia that we looked at where there was a colony of polyps. And remember that cnidarians have stinging cells. So somehow they separate out the stinging cells, and they don't know how they do this yet. They do know that they actually produce, the nudibranchs actually produce a mucus that chemically inhibits the firing of the nidocytes. So they don't want the nidocytes to fire, they want the nidocyte whole with its little nematocyst inside of it. And so they produce this mucus that prevents the nidocytes from firing. And so then they ingest them. And then they um, um, somehow they get them into their tentacle-like appendages on the surface of their back. So these appendages right here are brightly colored, and they also possess nidocytes. Okay. So they separate out the stinging cells, and then the stinging cells end up in the appendages on the back of the animal. So what this means is, is that the nudibranch now has a defense mechanism. It's not a defense mechanism that it inherited, but it's really, it's a defense mechanism that it ingested, right? So it, and so they don't really understand how um, all that works at a cellular level, but it's, it seems to work quite well. Okay, okay so we have another example of this um, where very similar to the stingless jellyfish, the nudibranchs become photosynthetic. And so this is a, um, a sea slug, and when they're born, they are clear in color, and after they start ingesting algae, the algae become incorporated into their cells. And so this is another example of an animal, animal becoming photosynthetic, right? So it relies upon sunlight. And then it actually you know, protects the algae, and it moves the algae around, and it provides the algae with nitrogen. So it's very similar to the symbiosis that you see in coral as well. Okay, so the muscular foot in the cephalopods right, has become the tentacles. So we see um, in the cephalopods, we see something um, very interesting in that these are actually active predators. And so we see that they have um, very complex sensory structures. So we're gonna talk about the eye in a minute. And then they have large brains, right? They're capable of pretty complex communication because if you've seen the videos of it, they could change color, right? So when like an octopus is really angry, it will turn red, right? Or if it's frightened, it might turn white, right? And so it uses color to communicate. And the squid actually flash, they're like neon flashes, right? And we don't even actually understand what all those flashing means. And so they have a very complex nervous system. And so what we see is, is that these guys have, because they're active predators, um, have developed some really complex sensory um, and um, large brains, okay? So let's take a, take a look at the evolution of eyes. And what I want to compare it to is the cephalopods. Cephalopods versus <coughs> vertebrates. So this would be like, the eye of a octopus versus like the eye of a tuna, right? So a tuna is a fish, it's a vertebrate. Okay. So if we look at the um, characteristics of the eyes, we see that we have photoreceptors right? and these photoreceptors 
are located in the retina. So I'll just draw a couple of photoreceptors. These are actually rods. We'll talk about the eyes when we get to vertebrates. So these are my photoreceptors, and they're actually in the back of the eye. So we have in front of the, of the retina, and this is not to scale, but this would be like my lens. Right? And so light comes in. I should use a different color. Light comes in, right? And what the lens does is it focuses the light onto the photoreceptors, right? So these are my photoreceptors. Okay. So there's a different way to build a lens, and there's a different way to kind of arrange the photoreceptors. So if we look at the lens, we could. Um, and we're looking at far away objects versus close objects, there's two ways to do it. So the lens, right, could move um, closer or further from retina. So this is to focus, so I'll put to focus. Okay, so this is like a camera. So if you think about your camera lens, right, you're actually, and watch your camera lens, it actually goes like this, right? The other way you can do it is you can change the shape of the lens. Okay. And changing the shape of the lens then would allow us to see things far away or close up, just like moving the lens uh, away or closer to, from the retina, okay? Now, the other thing has to do with the photoreceptors in the, in the eye. So the photoreceptors can, be, can look like this, where they can have all of the nerve cells that connect them coming out the back. Okay? And then it goes to the optic nerve. Okay? Or you could have your photoreceptors arranged like this, and you could have all of the wiring coming out of the front, and it could go around and then out to the optic nerve. Right? So this is like A and B, right? And this is like A and B. Okay, so it's just a different way to build an eye. Okay, so let's look at the octopus. Actually, let's look at us first. So how do you think we focus? So the octopus focuses one way, we focus the other. So does anybody know how do we focus on an image that is further away or closer to us? Do we move the lens or do we change the shape of the lens? Okay. Vertebrates change the shape of the lens. Yeah, not pupil dilation, but we actually have these little muscles that actually pull on the lens and they flatten it out and then they relax and they let the lens bulge. So vertebrates, like us, we are B. Okay. Octopus, squid, nautilus, they are A. It's just a different um, way to build the eye. Okay. Okay. So how about this? Which way do you think... So this is light, I should put this. So this is light coming in. Okay, so which one do you think is um, vertebrate and which one do you think is cephalopod? Which one do you think ours is? Which one makes more sense? A makes more sense, right? It's like, why would we put, like, if you were going to put a light detector, why would you put the cords out in front where the light has to come through, right? This is actually cephalopod, right? Yeah. right. Yes, right? So this is cephalopod. For some reason, I, our eyes are built like this, and it, does, it doesn't make any sense to me, right? But our eyes, we have all of the nervous tissue coming out the front of the photoreceptors, and then they have to go back 
and then go to the optic nerve. That's our blind spot where it exits the, exits the eye. Okay? So these are very transparent in us. So it doesn't seem to cause that much of a problem. But if you think about the squid, some squid live super deep, right? And if you go down there, the fish are all blind, right? They all like can't see anything, right? But the squid can see. And that might be because their eyes have a, seems like, if you're going to engineer it, right, it seems like you would build a light uh, receiver like A and not, not like B, okay? So A is cephalopod, and B is vertebrate. Okay, so we have just one more group that we're going to talk about. Okay, so phylum annelida, or annelida, annelida. These are the truly segmented worms. And they are segmented both, both internally and externally. That says internally. And so I want to show you, like just if I just showed you a segmented worm, this would include earthworms. And I'm going to draw some thin segments and I'm going to draw some thicker segments. Okay. So there's my segmented piece of my segmented worm. These organisms have what is called a hydrostatic skeleton. So if you think about them, earthworms are really soft, right? So we'll put, I'll put what these are. So this would be earthworms, clam worms. Um, there's even a Christmas tree worm, which we'll talk about. And tube worms. Now, the ectoparasite is the leech. So leeches are also. Okay. But if you think about an earthworm, an earthworm is really soft-bodied, but it is really strong, right? And if you notice, sometimes in the spring, you'll be like walking over really compacted grounds, and what you'll start to see are these little holes in the, in the earth, and then there's little piles of dirt, right? And so they actually use their hydroskeleton to actually burrow up and really through really compacted soil. And so they're really important in aerating the soil. So they kind of help to aerate the soil and to break it up. Okay? And they do this using their hydrostatic skeleton. So if we look at this, this is a segment that is filled with salomic fluid. And the walls of the, um, of the earthworm have two sets of muscles. So they have circular muscles. This squeezes the segment. And it makes it longer. And then we have longitudinal muscles, which shorten the segment, and it actually makes the segment fatter. Okay. And it does this by pressing against the hydrostatic fluid. So like if we're if I'm showing you the circular ones, it would be like you have contraction like this, right? So that's the circular muscle. And then what happens is the salomic fluid presses like this, right? 
So this is light blue, but the Sloman fluid presses out and it's gonna make it that segment get longer, okay? The longitudinal muscles are gonna contract like this. And what's gonna happen is, is that the salomic fluid, oops, the salomic fluid is going to push out like this. Okay, so that segment gets um, fatter. And this whole process is referred to as peristaltic burrowing. And this is how a soft, bodied organism can burrow through very hard earth. It's peristaltic burrowing. Okay. And this is important because it allows for aeration of the soil 